This is the iPhone 15, the latest phone from Apple, and while it doesn't carry the Pro label like the options above it, this might actually be a better phone, or at least a better choice for a lot of people. It might not have all the bells and whistles that the Pro does with an extra camera lens and a titanium housing, but what the 15 gets right is of far more importance, and in my opinion, this regular iPhone took the biggest leap out of any model in Apple's lineup this year. Today, I wanna dig into all the details with this phone, what's new this year, what's good, what's bad, and touch on a few things that I didn't expect and that you might not know about. So if you're interested in the iPhone 15, maybe you're thinking of buying one of these or you can't decide between this model and the Pro, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. In the past couple of years, we've seen a bit of a shift in the way that Apple does their iPhones. At first glance, it looks as though the regular iPhone is essentially the previous year's Pro, but with an aluminum housing and without a telephoto lens, but that isn't quite the case. This year, the iPhone 15 takes on a lot of the same design elements of the more expensive 15 Pro, getting rid of the sharp edges from last year's model in favor of rounded ones, and of course, moving from the lightning port to USB-C. The swap to USB-C was arguably arguably the biggest change in both models this year, which we'll dig into in a bit because there's a lot of neat stuff that Apple hasn't even talked about with that. But from a design perspective, that's kind of what's different structurally. Both this year's iPhones feel much nicer to hold in your hands with all those sharp edges. And the iPhone 15 is super light as well, coming in at 171 grams which makes us the lightest iPhone since the iPhone 12. The model I have here is black, which is honestly the only color that I like in the 15. I'm not even sure I'd call the other options colors. They're more just different shades of white. I'm not sure if that's because Apple is now embedding the colors into the glass or why these are so muted, but in any case, the black does look great. The way that it looks and feels kind of reminds me of my old black iPhone 7 when I first got it, just with a much more modern look. It doesn't show fingerprints easily, and the matte surface isn't slippery or prone to collecting dirt or dust. That said, most people are likely going to be using a case with their phones, so this might not be super important to you. I've been trying out a bunch of cases over the last week, and so far the ones that I've liked the most are these Rhino Shield ones. The buttons on them just feel the best out of any other cases that I've tried so far, and in my opinion, they just look clean, and I also threw on some of their screen protectors as well. Speaking of screens, if you flip over to the front side, you'll have the new Retina XDR display, which is quite an upgrade this year. The screen goes up to 2000 nits peak brightness with a sustained brightness of over a thousand nits, up from 1200 nits peak last year, and is great for viewing outdoors and in the sun. I've been taking a lot of photos and videos and testing this outside, and never at any point did I feel like I couldn't see the screen or that it was too dim. The colors are fantastic and vibrant. When watching content, dark scenes are quite viewable, and bright scenes aren't over the top, and that screen also houses the dynamic island, which is new to the iPhone 15. I'd say this isn't a huge deal, but there are some benefits to it like live activities or switching to apps that are running. Over the last year, I've mostly used this with apps like Spotify or Apple Music, switching tracks or popping into the app if I'm doing something else to change a playlist. With live activities, they've taken a bit longer to catch on or show up in apps, but they are handy with Uber Eats or delivery apps and things like this to see estimated times at a glance without having to go into the app. The unfortunate thing with live activities on iOS is I think they're sometimes best shown on an always on display, which the regular iPhone 15 did not get this year. The way that Apple does the always on display requires a variable refresh rate and the screen in the 15 still only does 60 Hertz and that refresh rate isn't variable or adaptive, which I think is unfortunate. I noticed it right when I switched from the pro glancing over to see the time or my notifications. But honestly, after a couple of hours, I got pretty used to just lifting my phone to see the same info. And the same goes for the smoothness or motion on the screen. When going from 120 Hertz display down to 60, you can definitely notice a bit more choppiness in on-screen motion. The 15 Pro feels a lot smoother navigating through menus and screens, but Apple does do animations and transitions really well in their software. So using a 60 Hertz display in your day-to-day -day is a lot less noticeable in iOS than it would be with Android. While that does take a little bit away from the iPhone 15 feature set, a positive side effect of not having a higher refresh rate and an always on display is the battery life is a bit better than the Pro. I get about eight hours screen on time, which is more than enough to last a full day and testing directly against 
against the 15 Pro, it seems to be about 30 minutes longer screen on time overall. The only area where I see significant draw where it will drain a lot faster is if you're using the camera, recording 4K video, or to a lesser extent gaming, but again, that's no different than most phones. In regards to the cameras, this is one of the biggest upgrades in my opinion over last year. The main sensor in the iPhone 15 is 48 megapixels and it differs slightly from the 14 Pro and 15 Pro. It's able to capture more light with a wider aperture, but the sensor is just a hair smaller, so it might not be technically as good in that sense, but it still takes pretty outstanding images. It's similar to the 15 Pro in that it takes 24 megapixel images, which the 14 Pro does not do. What's essentially going on there is the phone is using computational photography to combine two images. So you're gonna get a pixel bin 12 megapixel image, similar to how the iPhone 14 Pro makes its photos. But on top of that, the camera is gonna take a full resolution 48 megapixel image and combine the two in the middle at 24. This way you're supposed to get the best of both worlds. You get the increased light information from the shot with 12 and the detail from the 48. And so far I've been really impressed with the main lens. The enhanced HDR seems to work really well where the highlights pop a little bit more. And I do think that the skin tones have improved and look a lot more natural on the iPhone 15. You'll also notice that you get a 2X zoom option that makes a 12 megapixel image by cropping in on the full 48 megapixel sensor. So it's not gonna be grainy like it would if you're just using digital zoom, which effectively does does give you the equivalent of three lenses. To be totally honest, on my 14 Pro and my 15 Pro, I use a 2x zoom option more than I do the 3x, which is available on those Pro models. The zoom level isn't all that different, so in my opinion, you really aren't missing out on much there. You'll also get the new auto portrait mode feature that is only available on the 15 series phones, where as long as there's a person, a dog, or a cat in the picture, You'll see this little F icon show up in the corner that lets you take a portrait image from the regular camera mode. Or you can also activate it by just clicking anywhere on the screen. You can adjust that before or after you take the photo, which works pretty well for the most part. Occasionally it can struggle with some of the edges, especially if you go hard on the depth of field effect, but for a phone camera, it does have a decent amount of depth without portrait mode. That new sensor also does take very good night photos. I've been able to go out a few times and grab some good shots. And in general, this is gonna do exactly what most people want it to do. The ultra wide is just your average 12 megapixel lens, but it does take decent photos. Like most ultra wide lenses, the quality of the image does tend to taper off quite a bit when you get to the corners of the image where there's a bit of distortion and softness, but all in all, the color is decent and it's just as good as most ultra whites out there. On the video side of things, you have a bunch of new additions that again came with a 14 Pro. There's the action mode. If you're trying to get smooth, stabilized footage, say if you're running, and that will go up to 2.8K resolution. There's cinematic mode in 4K up to 30 frames per second on both the front and rear cameras. And as a whole, the HDR has improved not only in the photo photos, but on the video side as well. I can shoot all the way up to 4K60 if I want, but unlike the Pro models, I can't shoot Pro Raw images or ProRes videos, but that's probably fine for the iPhone 15. I rarely shoot Raw photos on my Pro iPhones, and on occasion I'll shoot ProRes video, but for most people, either of those options are likely not going to see any use. ProRes also takes up an enormous amount of storage. The iPhone 15 Pro mitigates that with the ability to record to an external SSD, but because you don't get the same bandwidth available on the USB-C port on the regular 15 that isn't possible on this device. So remember at the beginning of this video when I said there's some things with the USB-C functionality that Apple hasn't talked about? Well, this is where things get kind of interesting. The port on the iPhone 15 essentially runs at USB 2.0 with data speeds topping out at 480 megabits per second. You can plug a bunch of stuff in here and it just works out of the gate from SSDs to USB hubs and keyboards amongst other things, but it is notoriously slow. You can see running disk speed tests I get around 30 to 50 megabytes per second transfer speeds, which is basically the equivalent to a very bad high bandwidth internet connection. So if you're planning on doing any file transfers, especially if they're quite big, I don't know that this is really gonna be any better than using AirDrop, which for your average person is probably fine and more convenient anyway. I think the only time your average person is gonna plug their phones into anything is just to charge. That's all relatively straightforward and predictable, but what surprised me is that this port does have built-in DisplayPort functionality, meaning that if you hook this up to a monitor with a USB-C cable or use a USB-C to HDMI adapter, you can output video to those screens. On the surface, that might seem kind of silly, but when you start using apps like Netflix 
Netflix or Apple TV, this is when this starts to make sense. In most streaming apps, it will just automatically start playing content on the monitor with the playhead information shown on the phone. And the shocking part to me was that this is in full 4K. Like I said, that port is only good for 480 megabits per second data transfer and 4K is way higher than that. So you do get much higher bandwidth over a video signal. That's also very helpful if you play games on Apple Arcade that support an external controller. It kind of turns your iPhone into a little portable console with a video output. And with some products like these XR glasses, you can now use these directly with the iPhone without any devices in the middle, which wasn't the case pre-USB-C. The only catch with that is you cannot use the provided USB-C cable and you'll have to buy a 10 gigabit USB-C one. I mentioned this in my unboxing video, but if you plan on using a 10 gigabit cable with either the 15 or the 15 Pro, I just recommend getting one of the transfer speeds stamped on so you don't confuse it with one that doesn't have a similar speed. I'll drop some links in the description with a few options if you're interested in picking up a USB-C cable and you don't know which one to choose, along with any other accessories that I mentioned in this video. I have tried out a few games on here, which for the most part run smooth as butter, Anything on the Apple Arcade is totally fine and games that are a lot more demanding like Genshin Impact are smooth as well. You can notice a difference a little bit when you're panning around and moving really quick compared to the 15 Pro, but otherwise it feels very similar and is about on par with the 14 Pro. In benchmarks, the CPU was roughly 15% slower than the 15 Pro while the GPU was 19% slower. That tracks with what Apple said at the keynote, and it's pretty much dead on with the 14 Pro. Other than gaming, there really isn't much that I'd be concerned about with performance. iPhones have been more than powerful enough to do pretty much anything that we've wanted them to do for many years now. I haven't had any issues with heat, and everything has been very snappy without any hangups in the software with iOS 17. Just speaking of the software, there are a few things to note there. You'll get the new live voicemail feature in the iPhone 15, where you can see transcribed text of a voicemail someone has leaving you in real time if you want to answer it. Also, the new ultra wideband chip enables precision finding in the Find My app where you'll get three times the range when finding other people or devices using the same chip. So right now that's the 15 Pro, the Series 9 and Ultra 2 watches. This will provide you with more accurate information on where your devices are, similar to how AirTags or AirPods Pro 2s work. But where those products get about 15 meters range, you'll get about 60 with this new chip. Finally, the last thing that I want to talk about is wireless connectivity. The iPhone 15 differs a little bit here over the Pro in that it lacks Wi-Fi 6e and only has Wi-Fi 6. For that to make any difference, you'll have to own a Wi-Fi 6e router, but regardless, it still runs at speeds of over 600 megabits per second on my Wi-Fi network, which is outstanding. Honestly, that's more than enough for almost anything that you're gonna do on an iPhone, and for most people, I think that this phone is actually better suited for everyday use than the Pro models. There are some things that you're gonna miss out on. Some folks just love the ProMotion display, and that's fine. I know personally, I'd say out of anything on this phone, the feature that I miss the most versus the Pro would be the always on display, but even that really isn't a deal breaker for me. It's the most comfortable iPhone to use out of any that were released this year, and it is the lightest, has better battery life than the Pro, great camera system, and it just so happens to be the cheapest option out of the bunch, starting at $799. If you're not using any of the Pro features on your phone, like RAW photos or ProRes video, the iPhone 15 is an amazing phone with a lot of great features, and I don't think that you're gonna be disappointed with it. That being said, I would love to hear from you guys. What are some of the features that you look for in a phone? Do you care about a higher refresh rate display, pro camera features, or anything else that maybe I didn't mention? Drop a comment down below and let me know. That is it for me today. I hope you found this video useful or entertaining. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you wanna see more tech-related content or have a contest to see who can chew the most sticks of gum at once, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next upload.